Welcome back to the Bees and Honey podcast. Over the last six weeks, I've done a lot of episodes with artists. They seem very excited about the podcast, and it's become evident they want to have their voices heard. So I'm happy to provide a platform for that. Everyone's story is worth being heard. Today's episode uh, features an artist I've known for many years, and you probably know his work too, even if you don't know his name. Uh, His name is Stephen Bliss, and he's an Englishman living in New York for the last few years, and I'll let him tell you the rest of his story. Enjoy, Stephen Bliss. What I love about Anchor is that it's given me creative control of my own material. I was approached by a big company to do a podcast about the art world, and I didn't want to sign over all rights to them. Uh, Anchor has allowed me to make this podcast and to keep creative control, as well as financial control in terms of advertising. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free. You can use it on your phone or your computer. There are tools that help you to upload your recordings uh, that you've done separately or on the app. They'll distribute it for you as well, which again, you know, I couldn't wrap my mind around distribution and they have it all there for you in one place, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. Uh, You can easily make money from it as well. They help you advertise, as you can see right now, I'm getting my first ad out through Anchor. And all you have to do is download the app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Good luck with your podcast and getting your voice out there and owning your content. Hi, today we're speaking with Stephen Bliss, an English artist living in New York since uh, the mid-2000s, is that correct, the mid-2000s? 2001. 2001, yeah, you moved here in just after the... Just before 9-11, a few months before 9-11. Oh, wow. Which was a hell of an introduction. But no, I came over to uh, um, join Rockstar Games and work on the GTA 3 cover, which was the first game, Rockstar game, that went crazy with sales. What's GTA stand for? Grand Theft Auto. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. And it was kind of a crazy experience, sort of going, coming over here and like, and seeing that kind of cultural phenomenon. Unfold in front of your eyes. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, this P code that you arrived at our appointment with, mm-hmm. uh, was that a 2001 bring over or you got that later in life? <laughs> I got that a few years ago when uh, we went to a festival in England and it was freezing, middle of summer of course, and which raining. Which summer? Glastonbury? Like, it was a Port Elliot festival. Oh, okay. Which is, which was, um, it's more for adults that have children and they used to be naughty in London, the adults, and the <laughs> children become the adults for the weekend and the adults get messed up. <laughs> so uh, I yeah. found that coat. Um, covered in dog hair in the back of a car and I'm like I gotta wear something I gotta keep warm so I stuck it on covered in hair and like it it, it's like I'd never had so much interest from girls (laughs) from wearing that coat I don't know if it was like the uniform Mm -hmm. it's just it's just so uh, well tailored you can see it's well made it fits you perfectly the color is beautiful the buttons are shiny sailor buttons. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 a gorgeous piece. But well, I I'm come from a naval family as well. Ah. So I was born in Portsmouth. Mm-hmm. Which That's is in the south. Very south. It's where most of the ships were launched to take over the world with uh, during the British Empire. Oh. Okay. Not that I had anything to do with that. <laughs> but I was supposed to become a uh, join the navy. Fortunately, my art teacher told my parents that I could actually make money from doing art and art school back then was still considered I don't know radical feel full of communists (laughs) and uh, people who are never going to make any money right but there weren't the opportunities around like there are now well I could totally see you in the 
navy to tell you the truth i mean your build your face i think how you carry yourself you you have that uh military presence thank you well that's a a good compliment i'm glad um that comes across um i would have been retired by now though if i joined the navy my brother retired at like 50 and he's like living on a really good pension but anyway really you know I'm, i'm glad i'm an artist well i think you uh pretty much became what you probably were gonna be anyways and uh <laughs> you might uh not retire but you might live longer i mean i'm not sure why people retire but they yeah, can have well, fun too i would be doing what i'm doing right now if i'd retired exactly so tell us again uh, you were in school and that's how you started with art like when did you figure out that this was uh the path that you would follow like how old were you how did that develop well i'd won art prizes you know like a box of chocolate bars when i was five and eight I won, a pi- I won a competition for drawing a picture of Margaret Thatcher and previous to that when I was five I, I think it was a giraffe I drew and I knew that maybe I had some kind of talent but it was comic books like Spider-Man and Daredevil that inspired me to start copying those panels in the comics and try and get better and that went on and that can, you can see that influence in the rock star work that I did, the right. rock daughter work, right. with the black outline and the flat color. Mm-hmm. But the thing that really set me on the path was punk. It's British punk was like 60, uh, 76, 77, I was about 14. And when that came, it was like a huge cultural explosion that influenced thousands of kids to form bands. I formed bands and I started designing the posters to advertise the bands. Hmm. So I got into doing graphics and, you know, the, the, I'm surprised when I look back at the work from when I was at school, how kind of similar it is to what I do now. Obviously much better what I do now, but mm-hmm. that whole route came from punk and seeing artists like Jamie Reed and that whole fanzine do-it-yourself culture. Right. Um, I mean, it was, wonderful. it was a wonderful time to grow up. And you were drawing and stuff back then using what tools as opposed to now? I mean, do you use technology in how you create uh, the work now? Well, now it's... Well, my commercial work is Photoshop and Illustrator Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. Mac, Mm -hmm. but the the fine art that I do is all canvas-based, using uh, rip paper from around New York Mm -hmm. and uh, acrylic paint and spray paint as well. Right. I think maybe you can't talk about the commercial work because of uh, contracts or. Uh, I can't stuff talk like about that. Rockstar, but you know mm-hmm. all the other stuff I do, the commercial work. Mm-hmm. I can talk about. Well, I don't know which one we should start with, but we'll go back and forth, perhaps. So tell us what you're working on. Let's say now, and then we'll go backwards again. It's been a very creative year. I've mm-hmm. been doing a lot of fine art. I decided that I didn't want to show anyone my work. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to get on and and do a a really good body of work before I even showed anybody. So I've been concentrating on that for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, eight months or so, and it's been fantastic. So you have a studio and you're working there uh, pretty much every day? Yeah. And where's the studio? In Park Slope. Oh, okay. Um, what else? So commercial work, like I've just got a couple of watches being released by a company called Undone, which is a collaboration with Monopoly the board okay. game Monopoly mm-hmm. which I love because I still play Monopoly with my son 10 year old son mm-hmm. and he's so good at it I'm hoping he'll become some kind of real estate mogul <laughs> as opposed to an artist um, he always yeah. bankrupts me and my dad <laughs> he's really good yeah um, I mean mm-hmm. so doing the two watches that, I yeah. mean you know anyway Monopoly I like that what right. else am I doing well what, what how does that work like you design the watch or you drawn something like what is it uh, looking like what did you do for that collaboration they wanted the company wanted the uncle penny bags who's the traditional old guy in mm-hmm. the top hat mm-hmm. as a gangster mm-hmm. so i drew uncle penny bags holding two money guns money guns are the new thing i think the rappers use where they you fill it up with hundred dollar bills or hundred single dollar bills and you shoot them into the crowd uh, so you've got like, these guys jumping up and down, lying and out, grabbing at dollar bills. Supreme hmm. have just released one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm so out of it. I've never seen anything like that live. I mean, I think I've seen it on videos or yeah. stuff like that. 
Yeah. Um, what else? And then a, a sexy pinup girl that I guess is his girlfriend or something. Mm-hmm. So I painted those and they put them onto the watch faces. And when is that going to be launched? It's end of November. End of November. Yeah. All right. So a little while still, uh, maybe a couple weeks. And what else is going on? I mean, let me see. I think I asked you this already about how you grew into an artist. So what brought you to the USA? I guess it was Rockstar Games. Yeah, I knew Sam Hauser from London. He used to do clubs in London that I used to go to. And mm -hmm. um, he, he knew my work. I did a cover for Massive Attack. Mm -hmm. And he knew that. And he, asked, he said to me, he came around to see my work one day and said, could you do something like that for me? Mm -hmm. for Rockstar Games mm -hmm. so it was amazing I mean I flew over here to work for them and they, they were really good they put me up in an amazing place in Gramercy Park and mm -hmm. I just thought I'd, you know I'd made it you know it was, and stayed there for 16 years wow wow yeah. so what was the cover for Massive Attack you said? It's Massive Attack versus the Mad Professor so it was a it was no pro protection it was a dubbed version of the protection album oh okay and it's a fight scene between the Mad Professor, who's a uh, dub artist from the 70s. Mm -hmm. He's an icon of dub reggae. Okay. Um, him towering over a city, fighting massive attack as cartoons. And they're also fighting like ninja robots and, and, and you know, okay. it's a comic book scene. I'm going to have to look for that. I mean, I, I somehow didn't, I can't remember what that looks like, but I'm sure I must have seen it at some point. Um, I think we met when you were at Rockstar, and I wanted to ask if your work always involved these characters drawn in the format of comics, or if they are coming from real uh, people. Are these imagined people or real people, like that you used in your commercial work and also, I guess, some other stuff that you do? Well, you said for Monopoly it was imagined characters. So what about the other stuff? Did you make those people up in your head? Well, the rock star like Grand characters, Theft, uh, yeah, Grand they Theft came guys. from the games. And sometimes I would imagine them like uh, Lollipop Girl is based on Jane, my right. ex-wife. Right, yes, yes, yes. So a couple of them were real people, mm -hmm. but mainly they were they're based on, you know, the actors that actually form the characters within the video game. Right, okay. But since leaving there, people... People will uh, that people will commission me to do like the guy who owns Kith, for example. Nike won a portrait of this Ronnie. Can't remember his surname. So that will be in the kind of like influence of Grand Theft Auto. Oh, in I the did same quite a lot spirit. For Nike actually of, of personalities for their online website. Um, people that wear Nike stuff. Um, oh, okay. What else? Let yeah, and I did see. a campaign for Wicked Beer, which is all kind of like. Um, cartoon characters that they animated. Yes, I remember uh, seeing stuff like that from Wicked. I mean, I didn't know it was you, but I remember oh, yeah. what it looked like. Yeah, because I, I, they used to sponsor some events or stuff that I did in the mm. past. Um, some of your, uh, what I don't know how to describe it, but uh, the collage stuff on canvas, uh, I guess it's sort of like a poster work, the repurposed posters. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, so I've always loved that the, the, the decaying walls where people you are posting up illegal posters, advertising posters around mm -hmm. cities, and then people would just walk along and start ripping them down. And there's this beautiful thing that comes from layers of graphics coming through, and it's almost like historical documents um, of different graphics and different models from different areas, if right. you can find a good batch. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of the most beautiful things about New York for me was, was just walking down the street and seeing it. It was almost like an org organically developing every day because they're illegal, so the people that own the hoardings will paint this green paint over them. But some of the faces will come through from the models and I call them like grease, uh, green ghost pro uh, portraits because <laughs> they look like disembodied ghosts right. kind of just coming through the weaker bits of the green paint. Yeah. Um, I did a TED talk on it as well, but it's, you know, like, it's very remin reminiscent of Rotella. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I did, actually didn't come to Rotella until... After you were afterwards. doing it. That happens sometimes, and the, yeah. And what, hap what I had to do this TED talk on the, the we call, I call them palimpsests, because mm -hmm. 
the layers of historical documents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to, and uh, so I had to read a lot about Rotella. I, I wanted to understand why I was doing it more than just for the aesthetics of putting rip paper on a canvas. It's like, why am I actually, do I love this? And one thing I mainly got from Rotella is that he would cut a section out of a billboard in, in I think, Milan mm-hmm. and put it straight onto the canvas. So it was like a collaboration between the weather that were decaying the posters, mm-hmm. strangers that would come along and just rip gratuitously away from the poster, mm-hmm. like a decollage, mm-hmm. or even write, you know, messages on that. Right. So Rotella was having a, a three-way conversation, artistic conversation. So he yeah. would almost, he would keep it pure. He would keep, this is what I selected from a board, this is what I'm going to put on the canvas. And they're right. really beautiful. And of, back then, all the posters were hand-painted, you know, those like circus posters were all hand-painted mm-hmm. illustrations. So yes. they were way more beautiful than what you see around nowadays. It's true. Um, the difference with what I do is I use that as a basis for then painting onto. Then painting onto. So I use okay. like... Um, the posters layered and then you paint on top of that. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Is that what your new work is looking like too? Yeah. Okay. They're, um, I mean, you, if, if for want of a better reference point, mm-hmm. the what I paint is very in the style of Grand Theft Auto, mm-hmm. but more idiosyncratic more kind of like weirdos and um, I take a lot of pr- old vintage advertising mm-hmm. and mix up the slogans with some of the images right for like to I, I, li- I like to think there's a lot of humor in my work yes irony. yes I have to see uh, some of the new stuff because I I didn't ever see things in person just from what you sent yeah, or right. what was online um, so you're represented by B and A reps, and I think a lot of uh, working artists have them as a as a resource. How does this work out for you in terms of representation? How is it different from a gallery? Well, with B and A, they have brought me a lot of work over the years, the commercial work. Mm-hmm. And whilst I'd predominantly like to be doing my own work mm-hmm. and not have anyone else's idea anywhere near me. <laughs> Not only is it bringing money so I mm-hmm. can do my own, have my own indulgence with my own art, mm-hmm. but sometimes when you're in your cave, your artistic cave, mm-hmm. and you're like, the world's out there and you like, haven't got any feedback for a few months, it's nice to think that someone out there actually wants you. Yeah. So I'm like yeah. actually grateful to, to get the work from someone. Um, mm-hmm. And it really challenges me as well. I have to do things I, I don't, didn't think I could do. You know, if I get a brief, I'm yeah. like, how am I going to do that? Yeah. And then I have to do it because I said... You figure I it out. So it's good for making me better as an artist. And they get less than 50% as a, a commission when they find you work, right? Yeah, so it's cheaper than a gallery. Yeah, yeah. It's 30%. Which is still considerable, but it's not 50 Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they all do the legal work. They'll also be aware of licenses mm-hmm. so that I can... Be free. You know, Otherwise, you just get ripped off. Maybe they'll take an image and use it internationally and put it onto billboards when they said they're only going to use it online. That's true. About the client. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you, know, you have someone watching you. That. Yeah. yeah, that that's invaluable right there. Well, yeah. Yeah, no, that. Yeah, because you don't want that hassle later on to do that work yourself. And recently, Louisa at BNA got me two installations at a law company. Wow. Which is a job that I wouldn't. Have got myself mm-hmm. through her connections mm-hmm, mm-hmm. she got me that job and it was a lot of money and it gave me it gave me enough money to work on my own stuff for like six months right amazing and they were like two 14 foot by eight foot um installations and i wouldn't have done anything that big unless someone was paying me to do it right and this was work that was reflective of your own personal style when you it was the palimpsest rip paper mm-hmm. oh style. wow i'd love to see that i used up almost five years worth of paper that i'd collected from the streets of new york wow wow I, the whole studio was full of these panels that i was working on <laughs> it, was, it was such a challenge to balance that kind of chaos of, yeah. of colors and shapes and graphics on yeah, the yeah, 14 yeah. foot billboard. Wow, wow. Yeah. Oh, and God they really bless liked her. it. You know, when I, when I d- delivered it and put mm-hmm. it up, mm-hmm. I thought they're going to tell me. What is this? They're going to say, what is this? Get rid of it. Because in the contracts, like, if they didn't like it, they could give it back to me and not pay me. 
Oh. So I was like, all right, well, I didn't wow. make any money from that. And then, um, they, you know, they're going to say, what do you want me to do? What, you know, and I'm going to say, well, just stick it in the garbage. <laughs> that they loved it. And, Thank God. And it's just a, a good reflection of how you, as an artist, you can just sometimes think you're not very good at all. Yes, I think uh, you go through that sort of insecurity. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, I'm glad I'm they sure liked it's it. Healthy or not. I think it's human. I don't know if it's healthy, but it's it's uh, definitely something human. Um, what is the next question here? I was going to ask this, but I think you answered this already. What do you do when you are not working on a create? project for hire you just work on your own stuff yeah well what about the family life that's what I want to know about too because I know we spoke a little bit before we started recording but um, does your son show a certain interest in this creative stuff I know you want him to be the real estate tycoon but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would I want to save him from a life as, as being an artist I mean it's fun I got it is fantastic you know to wake up in the morning with enough money in the bank to work on exactly what I want to mm -hmm. experiment I mean it's nothing better than that yeah and yeah. I, I do that 14 hours a day if if there's a, you know I don't have to do freelance work right and I'm you know and I I think I'm a I'm a good influence on Alexander my son mm -hmm. in that if it was if he had a different father maybe he would be just playing baseball maybe he would just be into like hunting I don't know but it's amazing I think that he can now walk past rip posters in the street and see why that's actually interesting to look at yes yes. And it just makes the environment he's grown up in that much richer well i think as well uh just the idea of seeing these things like uh, you know because we walk by these things all the time but how many of us actually see them so you're training him how to look yeah at absolutely the world um also, I've always used the word design with him since mm -hmm. he was a little kid, so that he's conscious of good and bad design. Right. Um, and now, you know, when he was like five, he was saying to me, Daddy, I think you'll love this cartoon. The characters are really well designed. You know, and it was so good to hear that. <laughs> Again, it's like if you can appreciate the, the objects around you, yeah. you're making your life richer. Yeah. We need all like we yeah. can get yeah. in life to make it better and richer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to get through but the slog of it. He's just only really just got into drawing passionately. He, he now gets up in the morning and he'll draw and draw and draw and he'll go to bed with me saying, come on, you've got to get to bed because he's so passionate about drawing and it's wonderful to see that because it's only really happened in the past few months. Wow. Previous to that, he was completely nuts about sculpting. I think he's actually going to be a sculptor or an engineer because he loves building. Mm -hmm. we, went to, we went to Pratt yesterday, mm -hmm. and I've never seen the grounds there before, and it's full of beautiful uh, sculptures, sculptures right. and he was completely blown away by it. How so old I, is he now? Ten. He's ten, wow. So I can see, I can see him doing that. Yeah. But I do love the feeling of, of having that kind of influence on, on him that may not have existed if he had a different dad. Yeah, know? yeah, interesting. I mean, I love the idea too in kids about uh, them developing from a source which we have no knowledge of, it, it just being in them, even if we weren't around to bring it out in them. Does he go back with you to England sometimes? Or do you guys? We, we go back once a year. Mm -hmm. We should go back. Um, this year we're going to go again at Christmas. Mm -hmm. So my parents are getting much older now, and you know, in fact, he said he said to me like, "Let's go home for Christmas because you may not see your parents again," oh. which I thought was really uh, perceptive. perceptive of him. Yeah, yeah, and quite empathic as well. Yes, yes, yes. And he likes it down there in Portsmouth. We actually, we go up to Shropshire and my brother has a farmhouse up there. Oh, okay. That and, sounds um, nice. Hang out there. Yeah, I'm not sure if he, I think, you know, he does love getting all the presents. You know, <laughs> he's getting two Christmases from yeah, yeah, yeah. my ex-wife. Yeah. Then he goes to England and gets another Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's he brilliant. He gets like three movies on the plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, he, you know, he, he gets all the perks that he doesn't get here. Right. So what would you say is your next step? You have this work that you're, you've been doing over the last few months. I think you said eight months. So what's the next step with that work? Well, I've been doing that kind of work for about three years now since leaving Rockstar. Mm -hmm. And I've had shows, mm -hmm. one in L.A. and one in, um, 
where was the other one? England, in London. Mm -hmm. So I want to get a lot more shows. I want to get a decent gallery to represent me, mm -hmm. which is why I need a very strong body of work. Right. Something I can be proud of. Yeah. And I have, I have proud of my previous work, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to get better and be something that could be branded by a gallery to take it to the next level away from being labeled as street art. You know? Right, no, because it really isn't street art. But which galleries did you work with in LA or in England? I mean, I don't know, how long ago was that? Well, LA was um, Monarch's gallery, which is owned by a guy called Terry, who represent, he, he has a company called Secret Walls. Mm -hmm. Secret Walls is, is, is a live art battle mm -hmm. where two teams each get a canvas and you have like anything from three to ten artists mm -hmm. on each team painting over a two hour period with a crowd watching them do mm -hmm. the live painting at the end one of the teams wins and he does this internationally and he just opened up the gallery we opened it up in 2016 I did a show then it was like it's a 2,000 square foot gallery so then my first show was like a, it was 2,000 square foot which is huge yeah yeah so I think I did about 25 pieces mm -hmm. and um, what were the sizes of those pieces they were the big, like uh, I, I'm very really bad with sizes. I don't know. Like uh, 48 by 36 oh, okay. inches. And who else is in his gallery? Like they're all street artists and in inverted commas. Well, they're or? all street artists. I don't know who else he, he's uh, shown. Oh, okay. Pose was after me, I think. Uh huh. I don't know who else, but that kind of street artist. Right. And then in England was the um, West Bank. West Bank Gallery. Mm -hmm. Which is, what city is that in? That's in London, in Notting mm -hmm. Hill. Oh, okay. Again, it's street art, and after doing that show, I'm like, I gotta be really careful who I show with. Yeah, because you don't wanna be in that uh, It's category. really, it's really not... easy to be swallowed into that street art thing, and no one above that wants to really represent you, I don't think. But you did do that one thing when you were traveling, I can't remember where you said it was Guam? Oh yeah, we did. That, yeah. A bunch of us went to Guam. My friend mm -hmm. Tristan Eaton, on his fortieth birthday, mm -hmm. wanted to have like a Gemini party. So mm -hmm. all his Gemini friends, they were artists. We got red, he got Red Bull to represent mm -hmm. and pay for everything. Mm -hmm. We went to Guam. We we each did a mural over in Guam, oh. which was incredible. But you don't do that on a regular basis per se. Not as regular as some of those guys. Yeah. I've painted a couple in Miami at Art Basel. Oh, okay. One of them's still up. One's of uh, Debbie Harry. And Winwood Walls? Winwood, yeah. Oh, okay. Another one was the Two Girls Kissing, uh -huh. which I was actually warned that the, the guy who owns the wall didn't want me to paint Two Girls Kissing because <laughs> uh, he's sexist or something. Uh -huh. But I painted it anyway. I had my head in the sand. Right. First night, it was actually bombed by some other artist, oh. which is really annoying. Annoying. Yeah, yeah. and he, just, he tagged over it. Uh -huh. But then, I don't know how, f uh, how long it was up, because the landlord, I don't know, because I obviously left up Basel, yeah. and then it was buffed last time I saw, oh. which was a shame. Well, but anyway, it's good I to mean, have the record of it. Yeah, at least you have the record, and theoretically, this is part of the ephemeral nature of that stuff anyway, yeah, yeah. so... I mean, you know, unless we break the wall down and then put it in storage like some people do with Banksy's work, yeah. it always then disappears. And I've done one up at the Miami Ad School up in Queens as well, which is a huge collage of different couples kissing, like gay kissing and women kissing down on men and the, the old patriarchal system of the man kissing down to the woman. Right. So I did a whole series of kind of like breaking that old patriarchal romance uh, dynamic. Right. From all the old romance comics, you know. I wouldn't mind seeing that, to tell you the truth. I mean, I, I just because I mentioned Banksy before, I remembered uh, he did one with these two policemen kissing or stuff oh, like yeah. that. So that's also feeding into the similar sort of energy of the work that you were doing. Yeah. I wonder if it was at the same time as well. Well, are there street artists who you uh, looked at and who you think uh, influence your work at all? I mean, since we came to this, I mean, I never thought of you as a street artist, but I realized that some of it has translated to walls or whatever. But well, Tristan Eaton's a big influence and a good friend, and his work is just incredible, and he's so fast. I guess the, a lot of those guys in the early days had to avoid being arrested. Yeah. So they all learned to paint really fast. Mm -hmm. and, you know, 
the heat does incredibly beautiful large um, uh, you know murals he mm -hmm. did, just did a whole series of monsters for Universal Studios mm -hmm. that that's going to be out there forever you know um, who else? In LA, Universal. Yeah. Okay, wow. I love Insta's work as well. He does those animated murals where he'll paint a wall, photograph it, paint the wall, in a, uh, basically it'll paint the wall like a hundred times and each single photograph will make up an animation. Wow. Which is an incredible amount of work. That I can't even begin to yeah. imagine. How you should look at his taking. work. Okay, I'll look for Insta. Uh, maybe not right today but uh, in the next few days but they're getting increasingly ambitious the the wall art that you see around mm -hmm. internationally now mm -hmm. it's a very lucrative business now right I was recently looking at this other street artist I guess he's called JR the yeah. French guy I mean he has a solo exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum now yeah so I mean the crossover is real <laughs> yeah, he did the murals on the Mexican border, didn't he? Yes, 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 yes. Well, I mean, in the next few uh, years, I guess we'll be seeing more stuff like that going to auction too, because recently, I don't know who bought it, but Banksy's work was again selling for a ridiculous amount at Sotheby's, so maybe it's not such a bad thing to be in the street artist uh, milieu or You know, I'm really, I get really tired of people at parties saying... I could have bought a Banksy for five hundred dollars, <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, shut up!" You're like, "This hundredth person said that." Yeah, I actually yeah, could yeah, have yeah. bought one for five hundred dollars myself, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was like it's just monkey sprayed on a canvas. So I'm not paying five hundred for that. Right, for right, right, yeah. right. I mean, at the end of the day, I love how uh, Banksy's just making fun of all of us. Uh, like we're all monkeys, so, you know, it's just fantastic. sprayed on a canvas. <laughs> His uh, shredded piece of work at the gallery yeah at auction yeah he's a genius that guy brilliant brilliant yeah, yeah. brilliant i wouldn't mind finding out actually you know what they said he's one of the guys from massive attack no, not. he's not yeah that's just a story yeah if the guy uh, d from massive attack came to one of my shows and mm -hmm. there were a couple of big banksy fans so much so that they one guy had a whole arm of all banksy artwork He's tattoos? All, uh, tattoos. <laughs> wow. And he, like, he got it out in front of Dee and he's like, look at my arm, I'm covered in fancies. Looking at him like Dee was going to be like, oh, wow, well, I'm really grateful about that. He didn't say anything, but yeah. it was like, no, it's not, it's not him. Right. But I could show you a photograph afterwards. Right. And you'd probably wish I hadn't shown you. Yeah. Because it's better that he's anonymous. Because mm -hmm. he just, he, you know, he's a regular looking guy. Right. I don't know what people expect, you know, like, he, he used to have horns and... I don't know what they would expect. It's the fact that he's just hiding or it's hidden is, uh, makes him just even bigger than, you know, uh, uh, if we had seen what he looked like with horns. But, the, you know, the papers needed him to be anonymous. They must have known years ago, years. But without his um, being anonymous, they yeah. wouldn't have a story. Right. And everybody knows who Banks is. I mean, I don't think there's any artist in the world that's ever been as recognized as him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not at this time, at least. Um, recently, I was looking at uh, Damien Hirst's uh, Instagram, and I thought, well, he's uh, gotten pretty quiet these days in terms of what people are talking about, but he, he's still doing his work. And, you know, I, I like the idea of having an art life as opposed to just an art work. You know, he's still living his stuff, going his crazy way, doing Yeah. I mean, you know, everyone has their 15 minutes of fame, as Warhol would say, I guess. Uh, anyways, well, I think uh, we can probably stop here. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add before uh, we go. Is um, there something I didn't ask or anything I could say else? my Instagram tag. Oh, yes, please, do. At Stephen underscore bliss Stephen spelled s-t-e-p-h-e-n bliss as in happy with an underscore in, in the middle yes okay Stephen underscore bliss on Instagram handle and I hope I'm following you already if not I will do that now <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for being here and thanks for sharing all your wonderful ideas and I hope we can see some of your work soon me too thank you yes. for asking me you're welcome
Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Bees and Honey podcast. For the next few weeks, we will take a break from the artists that we've been engaging with in the last few weeks and hear the points of view of some other people in the art world. I look forward to having you again here on the Bees and Honey podcast.